Welcome to the Asian segment of Common Good. <laughs> Think about your last car wash. What did it look like? What did it smell like? How was the employee interaction? Were there any employees at all? Do you remember the name of that car wash? If you can answer yes to that last question, you are one in 10. The average driver can't name a single car wash brand, not even the one they go to. This is a 10, actually now $11 billion industry, and they're lacking a dominant player. Less than, uh, uh, the top chains actually represent less than 5% of the industry. Clearcoat, Supershield, Durashield, Rainex, Triple Foam, Carnuba, what does any of it mean? <laughs> We're sophisticated consumers who are victims of gimmicky messaging. And the day you think to yourself, today is a great day to get a car wash. So did everyone else. <laughs> get ready for some long lines. And while we've all had memorable restaurant service, so few memorable car wash experiences. <laughs> so I bought a car wash. The question was, could we take a failed location that was losing money year over year, and through an updated business model alone, turn it around? The answer, same exact location, and this is when we were open for business. We went from losing money annually every single year to making healthy profits every month. Among the many things we did, uh, we began to offer monthly unlimited plans so that cars go from being mostly dirty and sometimes clean to mostly clean and only sometimes dirty. Then we asked the question, if, if we had a blank slate and weren't taking over an existing wash, and we reimagined the customer-employee interaction, what would that look like? This is not a rendering. This is a, a drone shot from 200 feet up of our site in Lake in the Hills, Illinois. Among the many things we did, we really wanted to increase the employee control over the site as well as the number of touch points with the customer. Now the average customer before leaving will have an interaction with an employee three times. You're only as good as your customers say you are. Now these numbers would be great for any business, but let me tell you, in car washing, if you have 2.5 ratings, you are a rock star. <laughs> what are they talking about? Our people, our values, and sometimes Things they can't quite pinpoint, but know they love. All this admittedly is not why I got into the business. But now I believe it's why the Lord has me there. There are a number of things we do. Through our monthly unlimited plans, we rejuvenate people's relationships with their cars. Yes, there's tons of data about the subscription economy and why that's affected, but when their car is shiny, they're reminded of their car's appeal and why they chose it in the first place. Love your car again is the message we send to our customers. We believe this reinforces a much needed message of contentment. Rather than striving toward the next new car, appreciate what you have all over again. Rather than getting what you want, relearn to love what you have. Our customers are also touched through a culture of generosity. In an industry that tends to nickel and dime right, for every single thing you ask for, the first thing they hear at Everclean is, may I offer you a complimentary air freshener? They're also surprised by other unlimited amenities such as dash wipes, drying cloths. What else draws in an Everclean customer? Consumers gravitate towards our visuals and messaging because we feel like a world-class consumer products brand. Memorable customer experiences are created through professional service by people who actually like their jobs. Customers get in and out in three minutes with a cleaner car made possible through updated technology. 
We have designed Everclean from the ground up for our customers. Yet even more than being a customer-obsessed culture, we're an employee-obsessed culture. Many customers are, find, uh, are surprised to find we don't accept tips. Not only is this breaking with the past in an industry that relies heavily on tips, in our experience, this fosters a non-transactional possibility amidst a transaction. Since we don't accept tips, the, often is, uh, the office is often stocked with snack bars, apples, pizza, donuts, all dropped off by regular customers. We have helped reframe how customers think about our crew members and how they can creatively show their appreciation in ways other than money. Our position on tipping is one of many points of integration between our customer experience and our social mission to enrich the lives of the working class through opportunity and holistic mentorship. This happens most poignantly through the master plan, which is our talent development program. It's relationship-driven, values-based, modeled after Jesus' discipleship of the 12 and Paul's training mandate to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. It goes something like this. For every skill that you learn, first, I do, you watch. Then, I do, you help. You do, I help. You do, I watch. And finally, you teaching is the crowning achievement and indication that you've mastered a skill. What we focus on is integrating doing competencies with being competencies in the context of a relationship. We teach that fulfillment comes when you bring together who you are with what you do towards something you believe in alongside those you love. You do, I watch. This is Jesus saying, follow me. I'm going to do some miracles and you're largely just going to watch. This, I do, you help, is I'm going to feed a whole lot of people here in just a moment. Will you go hand out some bread and fish? Uh, you do, I help. Okay, now I'm going to send you out two by two. But yeah, that one, you couldn't do that because it takes fasting and prayer. Or something. I'll show you how to do that. And finally, you do, I watch, and you teach. I'm, I'm going away. And you're going to carry this forward. It's going to be amazing. And primarily what, you, what I want you to do is I want you to teach everyone to obey everything I've commanded you. Through the master plan, a management trainee starts at $9 an hour. And within 18 months, can make $70,000 with 99% medical coverage, 401k, run a site, manage a P&L, and lead a team. This has happened site after site for us. It sounds great, but as Helen just mentioned, it's really, really hard. For a few reasons, at least for me. The first reason it's hard is it's slow. In the moment, mentorship feels extremely inefficient. The mindset of mentorship shifts from the masses to one person. You know, I, I love to think about scale, growth, strategy, how I'm going to build this massive organization, but I don't love to just think about one person. Yet it's the time-tested, proven way of growing. It's how we've populated this planet. One person does the hard work of bearing a child. And in my case, it's my wife that's doing that hard work right now. Then years down the road, that person bears a child. It seems slow, but it's an unstoppable force. We've multiplied the Earth's population by seven times in the last 200 years that way. Sometimes it's this notion of changing the world that hampers our impact most. Very few of us will change the world. Most of us will leave our mark on a few people. 
We have plenty of messages challenging us to think bigger, but sometimes we need to think smaller. We need to think about one person. And that's hard. Second reason it's been hard for me is it's pretty awkward. I remember the first time my brother and I told each other, I love you. I was in high school, he was in college, it was weird. (laughs) That may quite possibly be the most awkward experience two brothers can have at any age, let alone as teenagers. But it was right. It was what we both wanted. And if we could embrace it and get through the initial discomfort and break from our past, we would land somewhere we both wanted. It's the same with company culture. We have norms and expectations of what it's supposed to be like in a company. And even if we're trying to do something we believe in, it's unfamiliar and it's awkward. I remember the first team dinner in my house. And it's like, cool, that sounds amazing. You have all of the crew members came over to our home. You know, and that sounds amazing, but coming into your boss's boss's house can be intimidating. And you wear uniforms at work. Now we get to see what everyone wears outside of work. Some people dress weird. <laughs> Playing goofy games, letting your guard down sounds amazing. But in the moment, you're thinking, Am I going to do it? Am I really going to get into it? Let's see what that person... There's a lot of awkwardness around that. Now, team dinners are normal. But other things, new things we're trying to do, are weird. We have to keep pushing forward with boldness and courage. And third, it's hard because it's messy. Business is messy. Largely because... Relationships are messy, and there are a lot of relationships in business. Uh, Broken contracts, uh, broken partnerships, firing, lawsuits, conflict. You know, just yesterday, uh, while I was coming here, we have been racing towards closing on land so we can race forward in construction before the winter. So all of my guys have been chasing down these deadlines. We close on the land, close the loan, we get the GC, bid out the whole thing, we get the excavator out to the property he's about to dig, we get a phone call and he goes, uh, there's soybeans all over this property. I don't even know what soybeans look like, I'm, I'm from <laughs> Chicago. Turns out a farmer had a verbal contract with the former seller and their soybeans and we're about to tear it all up. We don't have a contract with them. What do you do with that? We're trying to chase the winner, but we want to honor, honor the farmer. We don't have a legal, that's messy. Working that out, what do you do? But it's precisely in the messiness, it's precisely in the conflict that we get to extend overcoming grace. And we get to show that we care. And we get to show that people matter even if sometimes hard things do need to be said. There's a way to do that with grace and a way to work through that. I've been learning from C.S. Lewis since I was nine years old. Lewis masterfully weaves profound truth into children's stories. For example, tell me if you can relate to this scenario. The horse and his boy, the horse is saying to Shasta, do you know how to ride? And Shasta says, no. The horse says, well, if you can't ride, can you fall? (laughs) I suppose anyone can fall, said Shasta. I mean, can you fall and get up again without crying, and mount again, and fall again, and yet yet not be afraid of falling? And I read this as an adult. And I, in that moment, I stop and I'm like, okay, God, okay, I'll get up. I won't quit. I won't quit. I'll keep going. (laughs) There is something deep and profound. And as you're reading, it's not the same old story. There's something true and beautiful. The Narnia series are full of those gems. See, towards the end of his life, Lewis's writings favored less rhetoric and more stories. He believed rational argumentation was not as good as story. 
because the story is more like the real thing we're talking about. C.S. Lewis says of the Narnia series, and I quote, the whole chronicles are about Christ, end quote, even though the books never mention Jesus. Rather than through head-on doctrine, Lewis conveys Christ through narrative where it is free from obligation or inhibition. There's no need to feel certain things. And so a reader is able to fly under the radar or, and I quote, feel past the watchful dragons. And without knowing it, readers would see the gospel through story. What Lewis did in the Chronicles is what we're trying to do through business. Our whole business is about Christ. We're weaving the heart of God, the will of God into our daily work. So that without knowing it, employees, contractors, customers, even ourselves get to see the gospel through our company. Salaried employees are always surprised when they receive their first paycheck at the start of the pay cycle for the whole month. Once in a while, someone will ask, what? You mean, like, I could quit today on October 5th and still be paid for the whole month? Why would you do that? And I reply, the way the world works, you do, and therefore you receive. The way God is with me is I've already received everything I need in Christ, and therefore I can do. And oftentimes, I can do way more than I would have than the other way. It's called grace. Let me know if you want to talk about that some more. I've just shared a handful of our practices. We don't think everyone needs to run a company this way. Uh, there are a lot of ways to tell a story. This is ours. And we're not the source. We reflect on the way God intended earth to be, Eden. Eden is beautiful. When people get a glimpse of Eden, they fall in love. And moreover, they fall in love with the God behind it all. Eden is not a place of theological ideas. Eden is the physical manifestation of God's will in all things. So much of Jesus' ministry was just describing this other place. The kingdom of heaven is like. Our home run vision is to be hundreds of sites someday. With each site representing a life that was transformed from a part-time job hopper into a leader. And along the way, learning some values about how God's made the world. Our grand slam vision is that employees who've been with us 25 years would co-own an Everclean site and let that be the game-changing economic opportunity for them, their families, and generations to come serving as a modern expression of Jubilee. And for us, winning the World Series would be that when Jesus returns and he restores all things to his original intended purpose, that our company is one of the places that needs to change a little bit less. Because every day as we went to work, his kingdom came on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you.